The first Seabees from construction battalions were recruited by the United States Navy during World War II. They were skilled construction workers whose task was to assist in building naval bases in the theaters of war. In all, 325,000 men served as Seabees during the war. The first three naval construction battalions were formed in March 1942 by Admiral Ben Morrell, under the command of the Civil Engineer Corps. Enlistment was voluntary until December 1942, when the Selective Service System became responsible for recruitment. After basic training, including combat training, most members of newly formed battalions were sent to one of two advanced base depots at Davisville, Rhode Island or Port Wyneme, California for advanced before being shipped to an overseas assignment. Between tours of duty units would return to the Recuperation and Replacement Center at Camp Parks, California. As numbers grew the battalions were formed into regiments, the regiments into brigades, and brigades into a naval construction force for each theater of war. Special construction battalions and construction battalion detachments were also formed, containing men with specific construction skills. Eventually 190 battalions were created, in addition to detachments and maintenance units. During World War II the Seabees constructed over 400 advanced bases, in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters. In the Atlantic their work helped to protect the Panama Canal and Atlantic convoys, and to support operations in North Africa, Sicily, and mainland Italy, and the D-Day landings and subsequently in Western Europe, especially the crossing of the Rhine. In the Pacific, where 80% of Seabees were deployed, they built advance bases to defend the Aleutian Islands and to support American advances in the South Pacific, starting from the Society Islands, and in the Central Pacific, starting from the Gilberts, Marshalls, Carolines, and Marianas. The Pacific War often found the Seabees in close support of invasion forces, taking part in unloading supplies, and quickly constructing or restoring harbors, airstrips, and other facilities on newly captured islands. Their role in such operations as the invasion of Okinawa was central in bringing the war to its close. Topic: <laughs> Pre-war naval construction development. In the late 1930s, the US was not yet actively involved in fighting World War II, but saw the need to prepare for such an eventuality. Congress therefore authorized the expansion of naval shore activities, which included construction in the Caribbean and by 1939 in the Central Pacific. Following standard peacetime patterns the Navy awarded these contracts to civilian constructions firms. These privately owned constructions firms employed native civilian populations as well as Americans. These firms were answerable to Navy officers in charge of construction. By 1941 large Navy bases were being built in Guam, Midway and Wake Islands, Pearl Harbor, Iceland, Newfoundland, Bermuda, and Trinidad, in addition to many other places. Under international law, civilians were encouraged not to resist enemy military attacks. Resistance meant the workers could be summarily executed as guerrillas. The need for a militarized naval construction force to build advanced bases in the war zone was self-evident. Rear Admiral Ben Morrell, CEC, USN, became Chief of the Bureau of Yards and Docks in 1937. This office is in charge of the Civil Engineer Corps. There was a need for military personnel having specific qualifications as master journeymen in their trades to be permanently assigned as military construction battalions. On 28 December 1941, he requested specific authority to carry out this decision, and on 5 January 1942, he gained authority from the Bureau of Navigation to recruit men from the construction trades, skilled men, masters of their trades. In March 1942, Morrell began to actively seek permission for such battalions. The average age for the men being enlisted was 37. Naval construction battalions were officially authorized on the fifth day of March, 1942. The simple motto tells the story. The difficult we do at now, the impossible takes a little longer. An urgent problem confronting the Bureau of Yards and Docks was who should command the construction battalions. By Navy regulations, military command of naval personnel was limited to line officers. 
yet it was deemed essential that the newly established construction battalions should be commanded by officers of the Civil Engineer Corps who were trained in the skills required for the performance of construction work. The Bureau of Yards and Docks proposed that the necessary command authority should be bestowed on its Civil Engineer Corps officers. However, the Bureau of Naval Personnel successor to the Bureau of Navigation strongly objected to this proposal. Despite this opposition, Admiral Morrell personally presented the question to the Secretary of the Navy. On 19 March 1942, after due deliberation, the Secretary gave authority for officers of the Civil Engineer Corps to exercise military authority over all officers and enlisted men assigned to construction units. The Secretary's decision, which was incorporated in Navy regulations, removed a major roadblock in the conduct of CB operations. Of equal importance, it constituted a very significant morale booster for Civil Engineer Corps officers because it provided a lawful command authority status that tied them intimately into combat operations, the primary reason for the existence of any military force. From all points of view, Admiral Morrill's success in achieving this end contributed ultimately to the great success and fame of the Seabees. With authorization to establish construction battalions at hand and the question of command settled, the Bureau of Yards and Docks was confronted with the problem of recruiting, enlisting, and training Seabees, and then organizing the battalions and logistically supporting them in their operations. Plans for accomplishing these tasks were not already available, but were quickly developed, and because of the exigencies of war, much improvising was done. The CB logo in use today was created by Frank J. E. Affret, a file clerk employed at the Camp Endicott, Quonset Point, Rhode Island. E. Affret was known for the caricatures he drew, and one day a lieutenant asked E. Affret if he could draw a Disney style insignia that would identify and represent this new organization. He explained to Eafrit that this new construction group was unique, that it was not tactically offensive, but would be trained to defend themselves, the unit and the project without hesitation. After spending some time deliberating different ideas, the bee became his choice. Bees are the epitome of industry, always busy, working, and don't trouble others unless they are bothered first. At which point they retaliate with a sharp sting. He spent about three hours on a Sunday afternoon drawing it, adding the Navy's white sailor hat, made the bee a third-class petty officer, added tools of the trade, machinist mate, carpenter's mate, gunner's mate, and on each wrist added the CEC insignia for Civil Engineer Corps. He gave the bee a Tommy gun to show it meant business. As a border for the design he set the image inside a letter Q from Quonset, Quonset Point. The next morning he showed it to the lieutenant, who showed it to the captain, who sent it off to Admiral Morrell in Washington. The only thing the Admiral requested be changed was the cue. He asked that Eafrit change it to rope. In keeping with naval tradition for naval insignia, iconography the public would immediately identify. Topic the first Seabees The first Seabees volunteers were not raw recruits trade-wise at enlistment. Emphasis was placed on experience and skill, so all they had to do was adapt their civilian construction skills to military needs. To obtain men with the necessary qualifications, physical standards were less rigid than in other branches of the armed forces. Men were given advanced rank, pay based upon experience. The age range for enlistment was 18 to 50 but, after the formation of the initial battalions, it was discovered that several men past 60 had managed to join. During the early days of the war, the average age of the Seabees was 37. After December 1942 voluntary enlistments were halted by orders of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and men for the construction battalions had to be obtained through the selective service system. Afterwards, Seabees were on average much younger and came into the service with only rudimentary skills. The first recruits were the men who had built Boulder Dam, the National Highways, and New York skyscrapers. They had worked in the mines and quarries, dug the subway tunnels, worked in shipyards and built docks and wharfs. By the end of the war over 325,000 such men had enlisted in the Seabees. They knew more than 60 skilled trades, not to mention the unofficial ones of souvenir making and moonlight procurement. Nearly 11,400 officers joined the Civil Engineer Corps during the war, and 7,960 of them served with the Seabees. At naval construction training centers and advanced base depots on both coasts, Seabees learned construction trades, military discipline as well as advanced combat training. 
Although technically support troops, Seabees frequently found themselves in under fire with the Marines. After completing three weeks of boot training at Camp Allenver and later Camp Perry VA, the Seabees were formed into construction battalions or other types of construction units. The first four battalions were sent overseas immediately upon completion of boot training because of the urgent need for naval construction. The battalions that followed were sent to an advanced base depot at either Davisville, Rhode Island, or Port Wyneme, California. There the battalions, and later other units, underwent staging and outfitting. The Seabees received about six weeks of advanced military and technical training, underwent considerable unit training, and then were shipped to an overseas assignment. The basic military training was done by the Navy while the Marine Corps instructed Seabees in advanced military training. About 175,000 Seabees were staged directly through Port Wyneme during the war. As the war proceeded, deployment-weary Seabees and CB units from the Pacific were returned to the United States to the Construction Battalion R&R Center at Camp Parks, Shoemaker, California. Their units were reformed and reorganized, or decommissioned with the men assigned to other battalions. Seabees were given 30-day leaves and plenty of time for rest and recuperation. Eligible men were discharged at Camp Parks. The same was done at the Advance Base Receiving Barracks at Davisville, Rhode Island for Atlantic Battalions, the Construction Battalion, the fundamental unit of the CB organization. Each was of comprised a headquarters company plus four construction companies that had tradesmen with the necessary skills for doing any job. Headquarters would be staffed by administrative personnel, storekeepers, medical and dental personnel, draftsmen surveyors, cooks, laundrymen and post office. The standard battalion complement was set at 32 officers and 1,073 enlisted, but that varied on occasion. As the war progressed and construction projects became larger and more complex, more than one battalion frequently had to be assigned to a job. For efficient administrative control, battalions were organized into a regiment, and when necessary, two or more regiments were organized into a brigade. If needed two or more brigades would be organized into a naval construction force. An example was what happened on Okinawa. There, 55,000 Seabees were deployed with the battalions organized into regiments and brigades. All were under the command of the commander, construction troops, Commodore Andrew G. Bissett CEC. In addition to the Seabees his command also included 45,000 U.S. Army engineers, plus a few British engineers. In total the Admiral commanded 100,000 construction troops, the largest concentration of construction troops ever. Very little time passed before the Bureau of Yards and Docks realized the need for special purpose units. While the construction battalion itself was versatile enough to handle any project, it was apparent that some units could be specialized or smaller. The first departure from the standard CB was the special construction battalion, or as it was commonly referred to, the CB special. Quote dot quote. Special battalions were composed of stevedores and longshoremen who were badly needed for the unloading of cargo in combat zones. Many of the officers were recruited from the Merchant Marine and commissioned CEC, while stevedoring companies were the source of many of the enlisted. The efficiency of their training was demonstrated by the fact that cargo handling in combat zones was on par to that in the most efficient ports in the U.S. A smaller, specialized unit that was created was the Construction Battalion Maintenance Unit, CBMU, about one quarter the size of a regular CB. It was organized to take over the maintenance of a base after a regular battalion had completed construction and moved on to its next assignment. Another specialized CB unit was the Construction Battalion Detachment, CBD, ranging in size from 6 to 600 men, depending on the specialized task. These detachments did everything from operating tire repair shops to operating dredges. A principal use for them, however, was the handling, assembling, launching, and placing of pontoon causeways. Other specialized units were the motor trucking battalions, pontoon assembly detachments, and petroleum detachments specialists in pipelines and petroleum facilities. 
During WW2, the CBs were organized into 151 CBs, 39 SCBs, 164 CBDs, 136 CBMUs, 5 pontoon assembly detachments, 54 NCRs regiments, 12 NCBs brigades, and at various times, 5 naval construction forces. Topic: World War II During the Second World War, the Seabees performed in both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters of operation. At a cost of nearly $11 billion and many casualties, they constructed over 400 advanced bases along five figurative roads, which all had their beginnings in the continental United States. The South Atlantic Road wound through the Caribbean Sea to Africa, Sicily, and up the Italian peninsula. The North Atlantic Road passed through Newfoundland to Iceland, Great Britain, France, and Germany. The North Pacific Road passed through Alaska and along the Aleutian Island chain. The Central Pacific Road passed through the Hawaiian, Marshall, Gilbert, Mariana, and Ryukyu Islands. The South and the Philippines. Topic: The Atlantic Theater. In the South and Mid-Atlantic, CB contributions in the Caribbean, Central America, and South America were the first of many milestones. When the United States found itself in a two-ocean war, the Panama Canal became a strategic point. The convergence of military and maritime fleet traffic offered German U-boats a vital and tempting target. As a result, it beca me necessary to ring the canal's traffic approaches with protective bases. Agreements with the governments of Caribbean, Central American, and South American countries made it possible to secure sites for new bases throughout the area. The Lend-Lease Agreement, consummated with Great Britain in September 1940, yielded still other possible base sites in the region. Not only were new base sites rapidly acquired, but existing U.S. bases were enlarged. Under the Greenslade program of 1940 naval installations in Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Panama Canal zone were all expanded. The construction program undertaken in Puerto Rico W perhaps the most ambitious. The naval station Roosevelt Roads, seat of the 10th Naval District, was developed into the Pearl Harbor of the Caribbean. Most construction on existing bases, was carried out by civilian contractors until late 1943. Then CBs were assigned to complete unfinished construction jobs in this zone of operation. In the Atlantic coastal regions, these bases formed a chain from Bermuda to beyond the Brazilian bulge. On the Pacific side of the Americas, U.S. bases stretched from Honduras to Ecuador. Seaplanes, patrol bombers, blimps, and surface craft operating out of the new facilities to search for enemy vessels. At Carlson Airfield on Trinidad, the 80th segregated CB paved runways and built a giant blimp hangar. The 83rd CB cut an 8-mile S-curved highway up Trinidad's jungled mountain slopes. Beginning at the port of Spain and climbing to a height of 1,300 feet 400 meters. Completion of this road required CBs to move 1 million cubic yards of material. On the Galapagos Islands, Naval Construction Battalion Detachment 1012 outfitted a seaplane base with tank farms, pontoon piers, and a water system. Once this assignment had been accomplished, the detachment moved to Salinas, Ecuador. There they completed the United States' southernmost seaplane base crucial to the Pacific Sea Patrol Arc. In general the CBs, CBDs, and maintenance units that served in this manned bases completed pre-war. Although far from the front line, the tours of duty were important and necessary. North Africa found the Seabees in combat for the first time in the Atlantic. After landing with the assault on the 7th of November 1942, Seabees proceeded to construct facilities at Oran, Casablanca, Saifai, and Faidala. Later, while the Allies moved toward Tunisia and their final showdown with the Africa Corps, Seabees built a string of staging and training areas along the northern coast. They also constructed a huge naval air station at Port Lyautey, Morocco. After the Allies had taken Tunisia, the Seabees began a large-scale build-up at the new base in Bizite. There they prepared a new weapon of war, the steel pontoon. It would be used for the first time on the beaches of Sicily. Actually, pontoons were not new to naval warfare. 
Xerxes had used such devices to cross the Hellespont when he invaded Greece in the 5th century BC. The Cebes, however, had added some new innovations and cleverly adapted them to the requirements of modern amphibious warfare. The CB pontoon was standardized in size so they could be quickly assembled to form causeways, piers, or rhinos. As a result, these versatile magic boxes could be used to meet the exigencies of any number of situations like Legos. The beaches of Sicily had previously been considered by both the Allies and Axis as an impossible site for a major amphibious landing. Nevertheless, with help of the Seabees and their new pontoons, the Allies were able to carry off a surprise attack on the weakly defended Sicilian beaches. The enemy was quickly outflanked and overpowered as large numbers of men and huge amounts of equipment poured ashore over pontoon causeways with a minimum of casualties and delay. Thus, the Seabees were instrumental in beginning of the end for the southern stronghold of the Axis. These same landing techniques were later used at Salerno and Anzio on the Italian mainland. Unfortunately, the Germans had learned their lesson from the Sicilian debacle, and this time they were lying in wait. It was in the face of fierce resistance and heavy bombardment that the Allies suffered heavy casualties as they stormed ashore at both Salerno and Anzio, and the Seabees had their share of the casualties. At Anzio the situation was particularly desperate. That landing had been diversionary and, when the Germans staged a massive counterattack, the Allies were in immediate danger of being pushed back into the sea. It was the Seabees task to keep essential supplies and ammunition moving across the pontoon causeways to the struggling forces on the beachhead. Only with their assistance were the Allies able to turn the tide of battle and push inland in the wake of the slowly retreating Germans. For many months Seabees remained at Anzio under continuous German bombardment. They built cargo handling facilities, unloaded LSTs, and kept supplies moving to the front. German resistance in southern Italy finally collapsed and Rome was taken on 4 June 1944. Even so, the Seabees had one more task in the Mediterranean, the invasion of southern France at Toulon. While this was a relatively important job, it was eclipsed by what they j.g. add to for Normandy. Although CB accomplishments in the North Atlantic eventually culminated in the Normandy invasion, CB operations in that area had begun as early as March 1942. The CBs were first used on construction projects in Iceland, Newfoundland, and Greenland at bases previously acquired by treaty from Great Britain. CBs in Newfoundland helped construct a huge naval air station and naval base at Argentia. From these installations, aircraft and surface ships set forth to protect the many Allied convoys sailing the western sector of the North Atlantic. To complete the huge arc of bases stretching across the North Atlantic, even more Seabees were sent to the British Isles. At Londonderry, Northern Ireland, they constructed a huge, deep-water facility for naval craft and a naval air station that was capable of handling the largest aircraft. Loch Erne, Loch Ryan, and Rosneath in Scotland were transformed into huge storage depots, tank farms, industrial areas, and seaplane bases. Only with the firm establishment of the Navy's control of the seas, and the logistic battle of the North Atlantic under control, did the Seabees move to the southwest coast of England to prepare for the Great Invasion. From Milford Haven on the west coast of Wales down to Plymouth and over to Exeter, the Seabees built invasion bases which teemed with activity. There they prepared for their most critical and multifaceted role in the Atlantic theatre of operations. During D-Day of the Normandy invasion, 6 June 1944, the Seabees were among the first to go ashore as members of naval combat demolition units together with U.S. Army engineers. Their task was to destroy the steel and concrete obstructions that the Germans had built in the water and on the beaches to forestall amphibious landings. Quote, quote, they came under very heavy German fire. Whole teams were wiped out when shells prematurely detonated their explosives. Heedless of the danger, the NCDUs continued to work until all the charges were planted. As a result of their heroic actions gaps were created in the enemy's defenses that allowed the landing to proceed. Naval combat demolition units were only the beginning of the Seabees' work on Normandy's beaches. After the invasion fleet had arrived off the coast, the approximately 10,000 Seabees of Naval Construction Regiment 25 began manhandling their pontoon causeways onto the beach. It was over these causeways that the infantry charged ashore. Under constant German fire, Seabees succeeded in placing of their pontoon causeways. 
Allied troops and tanks subsequently went ashore in ever greater numbers and pushed the German defenders back. The CB contribution to the success of the invasion was not limited to pontoon causeways. They also manned their large pontoon assembled ferries, known as rhinos, that carried men and materials to the beaches. Those rhinos were CEC creations that Seabees assembled from modular pontoon units which they motorized. Vast amounts of equipment was hauled ashore on them. They also built offshore cargo and docking facilities, piers, and breakwaters. Some were simply repurposed cargo ships. Some were special prefabricated concrete structures floated across from England, while others were made from the Seabees ubiquitous steel pontoons. The huge port formed out of this odd combination of materials was known as Mulberry A even after the artificial harbor was partially destroyed in a severe storm. The Seabees landed hundreds of thousands of tons of war material daily. In addition to these massive amounts of supplies, by July 4, only 28 days after D Day, they had helped land more than a million Allied fighting men. The liberation of Cherbourg and Le Havre led to the next big Seabee project. The harbors of these two cities were very much needed by the Allies. Knowing of this need, the Germans left them in ruins before retreating. It fell to the Seabees to put these harbors back into service not combat engineers. At Cherbourg the first cargoes were landed within 11 days and within a month the harbor was capable of handling 14 ships simultaneously. Seabees made the same thing happen at Le Havre. At Brest, Lorient, and Saint-Nazaire, the Seabees rapidly cleared and rebuilt making those ports operational also. The last Seabee job in the European theatre took place with the crossing of the Rhine in March 1945. The U.S. Army, concerned about the Rhine River's swift and tricky currents, called upon the Seabees to do the job. The Seabees' first successful crossing was at Bad Neuenahr near Remagen. Further crossings followed in rapid succession as the Seabees made their task appear easy. On the 22nd of March 1945, General George South Patton, with CB assistance, put his armor across the Rhine at Oppenheim. CBs built pontoon ferries similar to the Rhinos of D-Day to transport his armor across the river. In all, the CBs operated more than 300 craft shuttling thousands of troops to the German homeland. One CB crew even had the distinction of ferrying Prime Minister Winston Churchill across the Rhine. The 69th Naval Construction Battalion had the distinction of being the only CB to serve in Germany, arriving at Bremen on the 27th of April 1945. The CBs of this battalion set up camp just outside the city. They immediately began the re-roofing of damaged buildings, installing plumbing and lighting, setting up shops and offices, and installing power lines. A detachment also repaired facilities at the nearby port of Bremerhaven. Later, a large detachment from the 69th Battalion was sent to Frankfurt am Main, which had been designated as the headquarters of the U.S. Navy for the occupation of Germany. There the detachment refurbished several buildings and performed considerable maintenance work. In August 1945 the men of this detachment completed their work and withdrew to Great Britain. The completion of this task marked the end of the Seabees North Atlantic Tour. Topic. The Pacific Theater Seabees in the Pacific Theater of Operations earned the gratitude of all who served with them or followed in their wake. Their deeds were unparalleled in the history of wartime construction. With 80% of the naval construction force concentrated in the Pacific, they literally built the road to victory over Japan, 111 major airstrips, 441 piers, 2,558 ammunition magazines, 700 square blocks of warehouses, hospitals to serve 70,000 patients, fuel tanks for 100 million gallons, and housing for 1,500,000 men. In construction and fighting operations, the Seabees served on over 300 islands and four continents. Of the three Pacific roads to victory the least significant in the end was the one which wound through the North Pacific. At the outset of hostilities, however, this region, which included Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, had been a Japanese target. The Japanese campaign of 1942 that succeeded in seizing the Aleutian Islands of Attu and Kiska was partly a feint, partly a serious probe of American defenses, and partly a move to prevent the United States from invading the Japanese homeland through the Aleutian and Kurile Islands. Many of the first Seabees were sent to the North Pacific to help forestall what appeared at the time to be a major Japanese offensive. 
By late June 1942 Seabees had landed in Alaska and had begun building advanced bases on Adak, Amchitka, in the Aleutian chain. In 1943 these new bases were used to stage the Joint Army-Navy Task Force that recaptured Attu and Kiska. While subsequent activity in the North Pacific was minimal, the long, flanking arm of Seabee-built bases pointing toward the Japanese home islands served as a substantial threat to the Japanese throughout the remainder of the war. Even as action in the Central, South, and Southwest Pacific areas became the major focus of attention, the Japanese continued to look northward with concern. In the South and Southwest Pacific the Seabee's first stop was in the Society Islands. The first CB departed Konis in January 1942 arriving one month later at Bora Bora in the Society Islands. The men called themselves, Bobcats. After the operation's codename Bobcat for Bora Bora, they had departed the states so quickly that the CB name had not been created. The Bobcats' task was to construct a fuel depot to service the ships and planes necessary to keep the sea lanes to Australia open. The Bobcats discovered that the island had many climatic and hygienic disadvantages, continual rainfall, 50 varieties of dysentery, skin diseases, and the dreaded elephantiasis. All combined to make life miserable for the construction men and were harbingers of what was awaiting their mates in the tropics. From the start air task was difficult as the island no piers from which to unload ships. Despite this and many almost overwhelming problems, the Bobcats set about accomplishing their objective. After devising a method of bringing supplies ashore aboard pontoon barges, they swiftly constructed the necessary fueling facilities. Their fruits of their labors came when the island's tank farms supplied the ships and planes that fought in the Battle of the Coral Sea. While the Bobcats labored on Bora Bora, the next groups of Navy construction men were organized into the 2nd and 3rd Construction Battalion detachments. Four months later the 2nd Detachment was sent to Tongatapu in the Tonga Islands while the 3rd Detachment went to Afate in the New Hebrides. Both islands were also on the Australia supply route and later would be used as staging areas for Allied operations in the Southwest Pacific. On these islands the Seabees constructed more tank farms, airfields, and supply depots, that would support military actions in the Coral Sea and Solomon Islands. The island of Espiritu Santo in the New Hebrides was closest in proximity to Japanese-held Guadalcanal and, thus, rapidly assumed major importance. Guadalcanal was the very tip of the Japanese thrust down the Solomon chain toward the Allied Southern Communications Route. The need to destroy the big Japanese airfields nearing completion on Guadalcanal was imperative. The Seabees of the 3rd Construction Battalion Detachment were rushed from Afate to Espiritu Santo to build a countermanding America airfield ASAP. Within 20 days the detachment had carved a 6,000-foot airstrip from the jungle. As a result of this feat, the U.S. were able to mount large-scale air attacks against Guadalcanal and destroy the dangerous Japanese airbase under construction there. When the Marines invaded Guadalcanal the 6th CB was with them and became the first CBs to work under combat conditions. Their immediate task was repairing Henderson Field which became a never-ending job. As fast as they repaired the strip and put down Marston matting, the Japanese would be back to bomb it. The engineers of the 6th CB came up with a system by which the CBs were able to repair bomb damage nearly as quick as the Japanese could make it. The Marines needed Henderson Field operational and the Seabees kept it that way. In doing so, Seaman 2nd Class Lawrence C. Bucky Mayer became the first Seabee to be decorated. In his off time, he had salvaged and repaired an inoperable machine gun which he used to down a strafing Japanese Zero. For this exploit, he was awarded the Silver Star posthumously as he was killed in action before receiving it. On the same day Guadalcanal was invaded, Marines landed on nearby Tulungi Island. There again Seabees also came ashore, but that time to construct a torpedo patrol boat and repair base. It would play a strategic role during the famous sea battles in the slot, the narrow channel between the islands of Tulungi, Savo, and Guadalcanal. Patrol boats darted from the Seabee-built advance base to scout Japanese offensive moves, and crippled American ships limped in to receive temporary Seabee repairs. As the Allies continued to island hop up the Solomon chain, the Russells, Rendover, New Georgia, and Bougainville also became centers of a frenzied construction effort by Seabee units. 
At the same time, Seabees in the Southwest Pacific were driving northward from Australia and New Guinea to the Philippines. It was during the landing on Treasury Island in the Solomons, on 28 November 1943, that Fireman First Class Aurelio Tassone, USNR, of the 87th CB became legendary for being the CB astride a bulldozer rolling over enemy positions. Tassone was operating his bulldozer when Lieutenant Charles E. Turnbull, CEC, USNR, told him Japanese machine gun emplacement was holding up the advance. Tassone took his dozer to the emplacement, using the blade as a shield and with Lieutenant Turnbull providing covering fire Tassone destroyed the bunker killing 12 Japanese. For this Tassone was awarded the Silver Star. By war's end Seabees in the Naval Construction Force would be awarded 33 Silver Stars, 5 Navy Crosses and over 2,000 Purple Hearts. They would lose 272 enlisted and 18 officers killed in action with an additional 500 plus lost to construction accidents. Seabees serving outside the NCF were notable in their own right. The Seabees in the southwest were tasked with enlarging and constructing numerous new depots in Australia. By mid-1943 Marauk, on New Guinea's southern coast became a hive of Seabee activity. After building an airstrip that helped fend off Japanese air attacks, they constructed a communications station at Port Moresby. In December 1943 Seabees redesignated to the Marine Corps landed with the 1st Marine Division landed in the assault on Cape Gloucester. During the battle, Seabees of the 3rd Battalion 19th Marines bulldozed paths to the Japanese lines so that American tanks could attack the hostile positions. The Seabees were so engrossed in their assignments they had to be told to hold up because they had created roads beyond the front lines. By New Year's Day, the Japanese airfields had been captured and the Cape was in U.S. possession. The Admiralty Islands, atop the Bismarck Sea, became the key to the isolation of Rabaul and the final neutralization of enemy forces on New Britain. When the Allies seized Manus Island and lost Negros Island, enemy supply and communication lines from all points north and east were cut. In the months following, the Seabees transformed Manus and Los Negros into the largest U.S. naval and air base in the Southwest Pacific. By 1944, the new base had become the primary supply and repair depot of the 7th Fleet. During the same month, the capture of Emirau Island in the St. Matthias Group completed the encirclement of Rabaul. There the Seabees built a strategic, two-field air base, storage and fuel depots, dry dock, miles of roads, and a PT base. Leapfrogging ahead with General Douglas MacArthur's forces, the Seabees reached Hollandia and turned it into a major forward base that would be instrumental in the liberation of the Philippines. The 3rd Naval Construction Brigade was with MacArthur for the assault the island of Leyte in October 1944. Seabees operated pontoon barges and causeway units that brought the MacArthur's forces ashore and fulfilled his famous promise to one day return. Those Seabees were soon joined by those of the 2nd and 7th Naval Construction Brigades, which had been staged in the Hawaiian Territory. This construction force numbered 37,000 men and spread out into the Philippine archipelago to build the facilities that would turn the entire Philippines into a forward base for the assault on the Japanese homeland. The 7th Fleet headquarters was moved to the Philippines and Seabees built the facilities that this enormous fleet required, fleet anchorages, submarine bases, ships repair facilities, fast torpedo boat bases. By the summer of 1945, U.S. military forces were prepared and poised for that last step on the South Pacific Road to victory. While the Seabees in the South and Southwest Pacific were working there toward the Philippines, their brothers to the North were working across the Central Pacific towards the center of the Japanese Empire. The Seabees in this zone made some of the greatest contributions toward winning the war. They continually played a major role in the fighting that characterized the island-hopping campaign adopted in the Central Pacific. One after the other, the Gilberts, Marshalls, Carolines, and Marianas were seized. After landing in the initial marine assaults, CB battalions built the advance bases from which the U.S. Pacific Fleet, the Marines, and the Army moved inexorably toward the Japanese homeland. Tarawa Atoll in the Gilberts was one of the toughest of them all. Only after savage fighting at a cost of nearly 1,000 American dead were the Japanese defenders overwhelmed. On Tarawa, the Seabees landed with the Marines and in a mere 15 hours put a shell-pocked airfield back into operation. 
On the atolls of Kwajalein, Eniwetok, and Majuro in the Marshalls, the Seabees contributed to the destruction of Japan's eastern defense perimeter. Seabees converted the idyllic atoll of Majuro into one of the major fleet anchorages in the Pacific, and similarly transformed Kwajalein Atoll into a major aviation facility. The Carolines were the third stepping stone on the Central Pacific Road to Tokyo. Combat and construction in this island chain served yet another purpose. When the fleet and air facilities in the Western Carolines were made operable by the Seabees, the islands were used as bases to support the coming liberation of the Philippines. The seizure of the Marianas spelled the beginning of the end for the Japanese. The loss of the islands cut the Japanese line of defense and, even more important, gave the United States an airbase from which bombers could strike at the very heart of the Japanese Empire, the homeland. It was during Operation Forager that the Seabees made one of their most significant contributions in the Pacific theater of operations. Seabees and Marines landed together on the beaches of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. The same day the Marines captured Aslito, the main Japanese airfield on Saipan, the Seabees were repairing its damaged runways. Despite interruptions by Japanese counterattacks, Seabees had the airstrip operational in four days. During the three-week battle for Guam, the Seabee stevedores unloaded ships while others did combat engineering for the Marine Corps. Eventually Seabees turned the island into an advanced headquarters for the U.S. Pacific Fleet, an airbase for Japan-bound B-29s, and a huge supply depot. The invasion of Tinian was another exhibition of Seabee ingenuity. Because its narrow beaches were bordered with low coral cliffs, Seabees devised special ramps mounted on LVT-2s which made landings possible where the Japanese thought they were impossible. Once ashore, and even before the island was secured, the bulldozers were at work on the damaged and unfinished Japanese airfield. After the Marianas campaign bomber crews needed an emergency landing field for crippled B-29s returning from raids. And field for shorter-ranged fighter planes to accompany them to their targets. The island chosen was Iwo Jima which 5th Amphibious Corps assaulted on 19 February 1945. For the assault CB-133 and the 31st CB were attached to the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions. The Marines were short pioneer battalions for the shore party assignments and the Marines had tasked CBs in this manner numerous times prior. While both battalions landed, in their entirety, with their respective combat echelons they were deployed differently. The 133rd suffered more men killed or wounded than any other battalion in CB history because the 23rd Marines deployed them exactly as if they were the USMC pioneers they were short. The 5th Marine Div. organized its shore parties in a different manner from the 4th Div., and the 31st NCB had just Seco, and its demolitions men on the beach D-Day. Only very basic road construction was accomplished during the first 10 days, the Seabees later built that emergency field and fighter airstrips. Seabees had an important role in the seizure of Okinawa on 1 April 1945. Off amphibious landing craft and over pontoons placed by the 130th CB landed the 24th Army Corps and 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps. Beside them were the 58th, 71st and 145th CBs. A few days later, the 44th and 130th CBs landed too. The fighting was heavy and prolonged, and organized resistance did not cease until 21 June 1945. The Seabees' task on Okinawa was immense. They built naval ports, a grid of roads, bomber and fighter fields, a seaplane base, Quonset villages, tank farms, storage dumps, hospitals, and ship repair facilities. Nearly 55,000 Seabees, organized into four brigades, participated in Okinawa construction operations. By August 1945, sufficient facilities, supplies, and manpower were on hand to mount an invasion of the Japanese home islands. Mid-year 1945, the USS Indianapolis CA-35 arrived at Tinian from the Naval Weapons Center at Port Chicago, California. Seabees of the 6th Naval Construction Brigade unloaded the components of the atomic bomb. They then stored the components in a CB-built shed, and posted guards for the contents were classified secret. Scientists assembled the weapon in the shed with several Seabees assisting when requested. On 6 August the bomb was loaded into a B-29 named the Enola Gay. 
With the weapon on board the Enola Gay took off from Northfield the largest airfield of the World War II CB built and headed for Japan. The mission that day was dropping of the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The event caused Japan to realize the war was lost. It prompted the Japanese government to negotiate a ceasefire on 16 August. On 2 September 1945 Japan formally surrendered, and Allied forces occupied the Japanese home islands in a peaceful manner. Thus, the Pacific roads to victory reached their final destination. Topic Pacific post-war legacy During the war many of the bases the Seabees built were disassembled for the materials to be reused in new bases closer to the front. However, the airfields were not something that could be moved and remained at the end of the war. The Seabees built hundreds of them across the Pacific. Today, after upgrades and modernizations, many are still being used. Abamama Atoll Airport 95th CB Alexari Point Army Airfield and Casco Cove Coast Guard Station 114th and 138th CBs Anderson Air Force Base 5th Construction Brigade Bowerfield International Airport 1st CB Barracoma Airfield 58th CB Abandoned Bonriki International Airport 3rd BN 18th Marines Buchholz Army Airfield 109th CB with CBs 74, 107, and 3rd BN 20th Marines Kearney Airfield Field CB-14 Abandoned Post-War Central Field Iwo Jima CBs 31, 62, 133. Dulag Airfield 61st CB East Field Saipan 51st CB The airfield is on the National Register of Historic Places as the Isley Field Historic District, and is part of the National Historic Landmark District on Saipan. Emirau Airport out of service but remains usable Falalop Airfield 51st CB Finschafen Airport 60th CB and US Army French Frigate Shoals Airport B Co CB5 Free Flight International Airport 3rd BN 20th Marines and 109th CB Funafuti International Airport 2nd CB Detachment Furumotu International Airport 1st CB Gasopa Airport Woodlark Airfield 60th CB Guiyuan Airport 61st and 93rd CB CBs Hawkins Field 3rd BN 18th Marines CB 74 and 98 Halewa Fighter Strip 14th CB Henderson Field Midway Atoll 1st CB Henderson Field Guadalcanal CB 6 14 18 Honiara International Airport CBS 6 14 18 Honolulu International Airport NAS Honolulu John Rogers Field 5th CB with CB's 13 64 and 133 Johnston Island Air Force Base CB's 5 10 and 99 Cookham Field CB's 6 26 46 6, 61 Leo Watamena Airport Lombrum Naval Base CB's 11 58 71 Losuia Airport Kirawina Airfield 60th CB Luganville Airfield 40th CB Majuro Airfield 100th CB used 20 years post war Marpy Point Field 51st CB and CBMU 614 The airfield is on the National Register of Historic Places as the Isley Field Historic District, and is part of the National Historic Landmark District on Saipan. Marine Corps Air Station Kaniohi Bay CB's 56, 112, 74 Momote Airport 40th CB Mono Airport 87th CB Munda Airport CB's 47 and 63 Nanumea Airfield 16th CB Naval Base Guam 5th Naval Construction Brigade Naval Air Base Tanapag 39th CB Site of NTTU Siapan Naval Technical Training Unit CIA Used post-war until 1962 Naval Air Station Kaniohi CB's 56, 74, 112 Naval Station Sangli Point is now Danilo Atienza Air Base PAF and Naval Base Kavite PN 77th CB, 12th Construction Regiment Nissan Island Airport 93rd CB North Field, Tinian. The airfield is an element of the Tinian National Historic Landmark District. 6th Construction Brigade NMCB 28 Northwest Field Guam 5th Naval Construction Brigade Semi Abandoned Numea Magenta Airport 11th CB Nukafatau Airfield Motalalo Airfield Ondonga Airfield CB's 37 and 82 Orat Field 5th Naval Construction Brigade Palmyra Cooper Airport Palakalo Bay Airfield 7th and 15th CB's Penryn Atoll has the Tongareva Airport Pitilu Island Airstrip status not found 71st CB Piva Airfield 
CB's 25, 53, 71, and 74 Ponham Island airstrip status not found 78 CB Puerto Princesa International Airport CB 84. Santo Pacoa International Airport CB's 3, 7 Saipan International Airport 3rd BN 20th Marines CB 121. The airfield is on the National Register of Historic Places as the Isley Field Historic District, and is part of the National Historic Landmark District on Saipan. South Field Iwo Jima CBs 31, 64, and 133 abandoned post-war Segi Point Airfield 47th CB Sega Airport 47th CB 9 Tontota Air Base 53rd CB Torokina Airfield CBs 25, 53, 71, and 75 Turtle Bay Airfield 3rd Construction Battalion Detachment, abandoned post-war Umiat Airport CBD 1058 Wake Island 85th CB West Field Tinian today is Tinian International Airport. Sixth Construction Brigade Yandina Airport CB's 33 and 35 Yomatan Auxiliary Airfield 87th CB Military Installations Naval Base Guam 5th Naval Brigade Naval Air Station Kubi Point now Subic Bay International Airport MCB's 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 11. 1951-56 Subic Bay Naval Station now Subic Bay Freeport Zone Marine Corps Air Station Futenma MCB-3 plus augment from decommissioned MCB-2 Nakon Phanom Airport MCB-3 1962 Camp Hansen MCBs-3, 9, 11 1965 Chu Lai Air Base now is Chu Lai International Airport MCB-10 1965 Naval Support Facility Diego Garcia and MCBs-1, 40, 62, 71 one, 133 and ACB2 1971-82 Topic. See also Leapfrogging strategy <laughs>